So, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm talking about uh, stuff to be done, performance improvement and challenges. So, today we have three topics. Uh, the first one is the overview of stuff to be done. And the second one is performance improvement and challenges. And the last one is interoperability problem. So let me introduce myself briefly. I'm a kernel, uh, Linux kernel engineer at uh, NTT Open Source Software Center and providing technical support for NTT group companies. And I'm mainly, I'm mainly contributing to Bridge and VLAN subsystem. Okay. So, <laughs> so the first topic is uh, the overview of stacked VLAN. So stacked VLAN is uh, usage of uh, VLAN where two or more VLAN tags are used in one packet. So in this case, uh, we have two types of VLAN headers and one is uh, the outer VLAN tag. Uh, uh, which has 888 TPID. This is called 802.1 ID header. And the other one is uh, normal uh, VLAN header. And this is called .1Q header. Uh, usually, uh, we use this .1 ID header for the outer header, but sometimes .1Q header is also used for the outer header. And why is stacked VLAN used? So mainly, this technology is used for Ethernet VPN or Metro Ethernet. So uh, in this figure, customers are, are using uh, VLAN tags. And uh, the carrier network uses the outer tag to separate uh, customers. So. So that customer can use their own VLAN uh, tax. And in other cases, uh, BEPA uses also dot ID VLAN uh, headers. And dot ID in Linux. There are four ways to use dot ID in Linux. And one is dot uh, ID VLAN device. And the second one is dot uh, ID VLAN wire bridge. And open usage and dot ID capable SRIV device is also uh, usable, but these are still in it next. So this figure uh, shows uh, the example of dot ID VLAN device. We can create is zero dot ten. This is a dot ID VLAN device, and on the top of the device, you can create the another VLAN device, is 0 0.10.20. And this is a normal VLAN device. <coughs> and let's go on to how much event and challenges. So, dot the one ID was introduced in Kindness 3.10, but at that time, acceleration features were uh, very few. So, uh, single dot one Q VLAN device has uh, many acceleration features, but uh, stacked VLAN device, uh, dot one Q device on another 
uh, another VLAN device has uh, very few features. This is because uh, uh, VLAN device had, doesn't have VLAN features. Uh, so the stack to VLAN device is created on another VLAN device. So its feature is derived from uh, VLAN devices, VLAN features. And this is a bit confusing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we can add uh, so needed acceleration features, but it, it could break some assumptions on VLAN packets. So this is uh, memory layout of uh, VLAN packets in kernel. In kernel network stack or in drivers with VLAN tag offload enabled, uh, the VLAN tags are embedded in struct escape buff. And it's, uh, the actual packet data doesn't have uh, VLAN header. And in drivers with VLAN tag offload disabled, uh, the VLAN header is embedded in SKB data. So there are implicit assumptions. Uh, a lot of code assumes. Kind uh, network stack handles only VLAN tag stripped SKB, or there's at most one VLAN tag in SKB data, or VLAN TPIT is uh, 8100. So these are all invalid for stacked VLANs. Uh, with stacked VLAN, uh, the outer attack have VLAN TPID uh, 8888. And in kernel network stack, the SKB data have VLAN headers as well. And in drivers with VLAN tag flow disabled, uh, there are two VLAN tags in SKB data. So, uh, the typical example of uh, this breaking this assumption is TX checksum of IPC some devices. Uh, this is uh, ICP of, uh, in kernel 3.10. And IGB has uh, IPC some uh, features, so uh, the kernel need to inform uh, the IP head offset to the device. So the IGB driver try to get the network protocol by VLAN get protocol helper function. And if the protocol is invalid, uh, specifically, it's not IP4 or IPv6, and the packet will be corrupted. And then the implementation of the VLAN GET protocol is like this. This handles only uh, VLAN protocol 8100 and handles at most one VLAN tag in SKB data. So IGB crafted to stack VLAN packets. This is already fixed. So VLAN get protocol can handle any number of VLAN tags. This is another example, uh, IXGB. And IXGB uh, get the network protocol by itself. Not using, not using uh, VLAN GET protocol, but also it handles only H100 or at most one VLAN tag in SKB data. So this is also fixed. But these are just examples. Uh, all drivers with IPC some feature should be careful with this failure. And the another difficulty of uh, stacked VLAN 
hard acceleration is uh, missing key infrastructure for stacked PR, especially uh, TSO. It could not be performed for stacked PR because uh, no in kernel infrastructure to determine if device can segment the stacked PR packets. <coughs> so, this figure shows uh, how packets uh, were read uh, from TCPIP stack to devices in kernel 3.10. There are no TSO GSO features, so there are no GSO packets. And ideally, we want uh, to send TSO packet from TCP layer and segment those packets at uh, the real device uh, if uh, the device is not capable of TSO for stack freedom by GSO. And if the device can TSO, uh, then we want to leverage it. <coughs> and simply adding TSO bit to the VLAN device and the stacked VLAN device uh, result in this figure. So GSO uh, will be performed, but it always performed. So even if the device can perform TSO for stacked VLAN, GSO is performed. Uh, so this is uh, how to determine if NIC is capable of TSO in kernel. The function name is native SKB features. In this feature, uh, it always has a disabled TSO uh, if the packet is tagged with uh, two or more tags. So <coughs> I moved it into the newly created uh, default feature check function. And if uh, the device has uh, NDO feature check callback, then uh, the check will be <coughs> skipped and GSO will be skipped. So in the driver, uh, this is example of IGB. IGB uses uh, the helper function pass through feature check. This does nothing. So if you want to skip that VLAN checking, uh, please use this pass through feature check. So with this, there is no need of segmentation and everything works. But if your driver does not support TSO but uh, implements NDO feature check, please make sure to call VLAN feature check in its NDO feature check. Otherwise, GSO, that, uh, GSO is not performed and the fact could be corrupted. So I'm, I have been talking about TX side, but what about RX side? Uh, RX checks some of IPC some devices and RSS uh, totally depend on devices capability to pass freedom. So we can do little for those features. And RPC and GRO, they did not work in current 3.10, but now they are fixed. So a major performance change uh, with kernel 3.10 and 4.7. So we used two uh, commodity servers connected to connected back to back, and the NIC is into 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet. This NIC is capable of TX checksum and TSO, TSO or stack to but cannot RX checksum and RSS. So 
the result is like this. Uh, this is single flow test result. There are three test cases, TCP stream and UDP stream long packet and UDP stream short packet. So from the TCP, TCP stream test, you can see uh, the double target case in kernel 4.7 reaches 10 G wire speed with single core. And UDP stream, uh, the performance improved uh, to some extent. <coughs> and this is multi flow test result. Uh, looking at the UDP stream short packet, uh, dot one q single tag case uh, scales uh, very well because of RSS. But stack VLAN cannot use RSS, so it, it is using RPS. So it does scale to some extent, but uh, it's not comparable to the dot one q case. So the summary for feature improvement. Uh, we have few features in kernel 3.10, but uh, the situation is uh, improved. But there are uh, some work to do for further improvement. For TX checksum with IP system devices, uh, some NICs still may corrupt double type packets because of incorrect handling of uh, IP head offset or something like that. So please use VDAN get protocol in drivers if possible. And for TSO, uh, please implement NVO feature check if your driver is capable of performing TSO on stack VDAN packets. And for RX checks, some of IPC some device and analysis, uh, there are some NICs like uh, Intel 10G uh, that have a feature to enter something like stack to VLAN mode. So in this, in this mode, the card can pass uh, stack to VLAN packets, but instead it cannot, it cannot pass other packets. <laughs> so it is a bit hard to use, but uh, in some ways, uh, we need a feature to tighten. <coughs> so uh, let's go on to the interoperability problem. So this is uh, a problem of packet size. Uh, single target packets have 1,522 bytes, and most NICs accept uh, those packets. But double target packets have 1,526 bytes, and some NICs do not accept them. But this size is needed to provide transparent Ethernet VPN for users. <laughs> So uh, look at this figure. End user send a single tag packet and dot my switch add uh, another tag and the packet gets 1,526 bytes and some doesn't accept this size of packet and dropped on it due to oversize error. There are examples from our lab. Uh, Ethan E, uh, sorry, E, E, thousand D, E, thousand D, it, it drops packet uh, larger than 1,522 bytes. And BNX2X and IXGB 
uh, uh, they are similar, but but they drops uh, the packets larger than a thousand five hundred and eighteen bytes if the packets are not read on type one. And MLX4 and NHFC, they accept pack, uh, double target packets. It, it's because they take into account double tag or they have extra room due to alignment restriction. And IDB also accepts double target packets. Um, it accepts jump frames by default. So how to solve this problem? There are some possible approaches. The first one is reduce VLAN device MTU. Uh, but this does not change the size of received packet, so this doesn't solve the problem. Well, then increase real device MTU. Yes, this uh, solves the problem. Yes, but this allows uh, anti frames to be jump frames. So there could be another problem with this uh, with this way. So then accept larger size packets by default, like RGB. But some Nix, as far as I know, some Nix change their behavior when accepting larger size, changing the, changing the max accept of the size. Uh, the example is E thousand D and QLG. So my proposal is uh, envelope frames. Introduce to introduce envelope frames. So envelope frame is uh, a packet <coughs> which has a normal uh, thousand and five hundred MTU. And in addition to the MTU, uh, the additional packet encapsulation header uh, up to 482 bytes. So uh, with introducing this uh, envelope frame implementation in kernel, uh, the device can accept envelope frame, but send uh, that does not send jump frame. So this is envisioned implementation. Question. So the go back to your slide. Okay. Yeah. So the this is a. Do you need anything in the hardware to support this? Uh, sorry. You do. So. You, you need some hardware support for this to work, right? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, actually, my proposal is uh, using jumbo frame support. Okay, so you're just going to cheat by making it a big jumbo frame and inserting, or you have to turn some feature on? Sorry? Are, are you, so you're just making, you're sending a jumbo frame? Ah, no, 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 no. Right. My proposal is receive jumbo frames, but don't send jump frames. Uh, so some of some routers I know actually have like two values for um, MTUs. I uh, I don't know. Some call them MRU specifically with PPP links, and I think it would actually also fit the Linux model. We already have an MTU, for example, for IPv6, which is not the same like the interface MTU, and we have an IPv4 MTU. So I think it would actually not be bad to just say like, okay, we, we make a link MTU, an IPv4 MTU, an IPv6 MTU, we basically already have that. So you could say like, you could increase the MTU on the link, but the IPv4 MTU, which is synced with the maximum segment size, for example, in TCP, would still be 1,500 by default, and nothing would change on the upper protocols, but 
you could communicate to the driver at least that you want to have um, more space and maybe that could be done by default at some point in time. But I'm not a driver expert to say what, uh, if there are implications over all drivers. Maybe it could also be a bit that drivers say I, I can deal with it. <clears throat> but uh, but uh, this won't work anyway on RX, right? I mean, like, this is the question Jamal is asking. If you have a variable size receive, if that encapsulation header, the yellow portion, is a variable size, unless your hardware knows how to parse it, it will not know where the next header is going to start, so stateless offloads will all break. Uh, I, I am not proposing uh, parsing the, uh, the additional encapsulation header. I'm just proposing uh, accepting a larger size packet, but don't, don't send uh, large size packet without encapsulation header. So, um, just for some background, the reason IGB accepts jumbo frames is because I rewrote the receive path about 10 different times um, and finally got to the point where I could accept jumbo frames generically. Um, I think the one thing you're going to run into with this setup is enabling jumbo frames on a lot of setups absolutely tanks performance. Basically what you end up with is they go to not, most NIC drivers will go to non-optimal buffer configurations and you will see the performance drop to maybe half to three quarters of what you could get normally. Um, in addition, adding more headers at this point is just going to make your uh, traffic path that much worse. Um, what I think you may want to honestly look at, um, you already had mentioned in another uh, piece that you were going to need to look at somehow making the drivers register the ability for the uh, secondary v VLAN tags, that would be the spot to also look at if you need to increase the MTU or not, ideally. Um, you need to really just communicate to the drivers that, hey, I, I want to support this extra v uh, this, the 8021Q what AD, or 8021AD tag. <clears throat> so I know, for example, in the case of IXGBE, it'll let you take it up four more bytes, or no, eight more bytes, right? No, it's four more, I think, for VLAN. If it recognizes an outer VLAN tag because you set those fields in the hardware, and so that's something else to be aware of. You're implementing this, and it may not actually be necessary if the hardware can support the secondary tag. Well, you say that the when you turn on the jumbo frames, the performance tanks, is that irrespective of the actual MTU you set? Um, Pretty much, yes. Yeah, there, so for some drivers, if you take it up from 1500 to 1501, it completely changes the buffer allocation scheme. Yes. <laughs> yep. So like, especially in the case of like, I think E1000E, uh, there's other side effects because it has problems where you can't let the CPU go into too deep of a sleep state because it'll actually cause it to start corrupting data on the packets. So at that point, you lose CPU power states because you turned on jumbo frames. So, you know, turning on something like this, you know, Facebook might not appreciate their data center losing the ability to go into a deep sleep state on their CPU because we've turned on jumbo frames by default from now on. Well, yeah. So, uh, with regard to the stateless offloads, so any checksum offload, as long as the device is doing the generic um, method should be compatible with this. We probably will lose RSS, um, and there may not be a way around that. As for the TSO, I don't know if you thought about this, but maybe maybe this will work, maybe it won't. Well, it should, well, most hardware doesn't care. It's just it gets replicated, except for... Um, I'll just yell. Um, so for, for VLAN tag insertion, um, I'm assuming the inner tag is the one that's stored in the SK buff as the metadata, and the outer tag is actually on the frame. Is that right? Right. Okay, uh, yes. No, uh, the outer tag is dot one eighty tag, so this is uh, usually not supported by Nix, so these are all embedded in SKB data. So the outer tag is the one that's up in the SK buff, yeah. Yeah. and the inner tag is the one that's actually in the data? And that is also in SKB data. Yeah, so uh, in addition, we're, yeah, we can't do TSO. We can't do TSO, we can't do VLAN tag insertion in that case. 
because the ordering is wrong. Because a lot of NICs, they will do the BMN tag insertion at the start of the network header. So if you inserted the outer tag, then we can insert after uh, the outer tag, we can insert the inner tag, but we can't insert the outer tag before the, the inner tag. Unless your hardware is completely capable of doing both. Right. Um, which I-40E is completely capable. Yeah, I-40E is, but IXGBE, IGB, all of those other ones are not. I, uh, Raise your hand, please, so give you the mic. Okay. So it's just something to be aware of, because, yeah, if you want to get TSO support, you're going to probably want to leave the outer tag in the SKB data and actually do the in, do an tag insertion for the inner tag. Uh, right. No, no, no. And now IXGB can skip it. I confirmed. What's that? Uh, IXGB can skip uh, any number of tags. Yes. On receive. On, re on receive. No, uh, actually, receive. it doesn't no, skip no, tags no. on receive. I'm talking about TSO. Well, yeah, it can skip over it. But if you're doing VLAN, so it can't do VLAN tag and so are you storing both VLAN tags and SKB data? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so, but if you're wanting to do that with, so yeah, okay, so I'm getting into a separate thing. Yeah, TSO you can skip over, that's fine. It's just if you're doing VLAN tag insertion, um, yeah, anyway, it's, we're getting into some complicated details here, so it's probably, yeah. No, it's a, so anyway, my proposal is like this. Uh, I introduce a variable max envelope header length and set from user space like this, IP link set, uh, envelope header length. And then expand accept, uh, acceptable packet size of NIC by envelope header length, in this case, eight. So the driver's implementation is uh, replacing DevMTU with DevMTU <coughs> plus M headline to accept longer packet size. And do not change DevMTU. So the current networking stack doesn't send uh, longer sized packet other than uh, those encapsulated from upper devices. So RFC is all, uh, already posted, so I'll be happy if uh, anyone here can review this. <laughs> and in the future, uh, uh, it's, it's the idea to inform real device drivers of M headline on creating dot twenty VLAN device. So this is summary. Uh, the performance has improved since 3.10, TCP reaches 10G with one core. But we need more work in drivers for future further improvement. For interoperability, uh, the problem is stacked VLAN packets get dropped due to oversize. And the pro my proposal is to introducing to, to introduce ML frames. The RFC is posted. So I have one minute left. <laughs> Any question? Uh, would it be possible to just make uh, do a kernel wide replacement and like deprecate MTU? This is like a question towards Dave, who's probably not in the room anymore, but. Um, it's the kind of thing to remove the dev MTU member and replace all instances in the kernel with um, a helper function that gets you the, the MTU back, right? So you use Coxinil to do a machine replacement of all those instances, and then um, and then it takes into account your env header len. You just put that in the kernel function that returns the MTU or the the, the, the buffer configuration to the drivers. I'm not sure if that's a something that we, we would do, but we've done similar transforms, I think, to deprecate members before. So for the upper layers, we could basically do that with the routing subsystem, where we always use these TMTU getters and setters. Right. So, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a discussion of how to represent it and how, to, how it should feel and look like. I think it's both things are acceptable. It's possible. Yeah. 
So I, I wanted to say that uh, we kind of had a bit of a similar problem where we have a 1500 MPU clean network and for tunneling purposes we wanted something higher than that. Um, and we didn't actually want to increase the MTU that normally gets used on transmit, um, but we did want to increase the MTU that could potentially be received. And basically we introduced this receive MTU contact uh, being different than transmit MTU. So it, it does seem like it would be something that would be uh, generically useful. Um, we did run into the problem that if you, uh, if you if you have this receive MTU that is basically what the NICs are supposed to be capable of receiving, and you have the MTU, um, then you actually can't transmit packets larger than MTU because you run into checks in the routing table. Um, so, I don't know, just kind of something along these lines would probably be a useful addition. I agree, I would also like go with an MRU, I guess what I've seen, so you have an MRU which gets like sent to the driver and an MTU which is like used for MSS or for upper protocol stuff. And then we have actually the MTU6 which is the IPv6 MTU which is only configurable in Procofest but it's calculated based on the IPv4 MTU which is also like a little bit strange. And, and it would be nice if the, the IP uh, MTU discovery stuff, I think it's like uh, MTU disk probe or something like that. Um, was actually uh, checking the highest possible MTU as, instead of, or maybe entirely ignoring MTU instead of honoring device MTU. Not entirely sure how that would work. Sorry, again? Um, so uh, on IP sockets, both for V4 and V6, uh, you can uh, disable, uh, you, you, there's, there's various levels of, M, uh, of path MTU discovery. Yep. And one of them is, is MTU probe which is basically the, I want to do it myself. I want to send a packet and see if it gets dropped. And currently, you can't send a packet out if it's larger than device MTU. Um, so uh, even, you even can actually, there is a non-documented option, which is um, <laughs> omit. <laughs> yeah, I should probably do that. Soon. Okay, so documentation <laughs> for that option would be nice. <laughs> I, will, I will set you the link and I will provide documentation. <clears throat> Uh, have you considered using VXLAN for the encapsulation? VXLAN? VXLAN. Uh, so, so VXLAN uh, by default reduces its MTU. So basically uh, VXLAN does need this feature, but if uh, you want to increase uh, the VXLAN device's MTU, then uh, uh, setting the M headline with the VXLAN encapsulation headline will help, I think. Yeah, I also mean instead of the double VLAN tagging. Yes. Just use one VXLAN tag. Huh? Basically, use one VXLAN tag instead of double VX VLAN tagging. Double VXLAN? So, one VXLAN tag, where now you use two VLAN tag. One VX on tag. 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 I think the problem is you're talking like an L4 transport replacement for his L2 VLAN. Yeah, the, the first VLAN tag is getting added outside of their network, right? And they're only adding the second VLAN tag. So they would have to strip the first VLAN tag off at the edge and replace it with a VXLAN tag. And have a mapping table, yeah, and then do the reverse yeah, when it leaves their network. <laughs> there we go. I'm, I'm too loud. <laughs> okay, thank you.